So I am a wildlife photographer that also calls myself a conservation photographer. And conservation photography is a genre that has really grown in the last few years and is becoming recognized as a, a real genre unto itself. Unto itself. And um, there's actually a league called the International League of Conservation Photographers. And you can go to that website and, and read about the work of people who are really very much steeped in conservation photography and are helping to save particular species or particular habitats. And I sort of have a dream of someday possibly joining that league. I don't know if I'd ever be worthy, but, but you can still be a conservation photographer without being a part of that league. And I want to talk a little bit about how you can do that in very basic ways, how you can draw attention through photos to a place that's special to you, um, a place that you care about, a place that you really feel others need to know about, and that you really want to champion in some way. Um, so let's move through some slides here. I photographed elephants a bit before I was really a photographer. I studied elephants and elephant communication uh, for the Elephant Listening Project which studied the acoustic communication of forest elephants. And I lived in the Central African Republic for two field seasons and um, was very privileged to go to a clearing uh, in the forest every day. And up on a platform, I would sit with the other researchers and we'd look down on this saline clearing called a bai by the pygmies. They, they called it a bai, B-A-I and about 150 to 200 elephants would gather there every day to drink from these mineral rich waters. And it was just the most incredible experience to be able to see elephants engaging in natural behavior of every kind, you know, mating and babies playing and big males jousting and sometimes a gorilla would come into the clearing to, to drink from the, the mineral rich waters or the clay. So that was a profound experience, and, and that's really where I began to learn about the biology of animals. I don't have a background in biology. My background's in English literature and education. I have a master's in education from, from Stanford, and I've been a teacher. So I first want to move through just some basic pictures to talk about what makes a photo effective to viewers. What are some ways that we can grab viewers' attentions, attention to, um, to make them care about the subject that we're photographing? And so I'm going to show you a couple different photos of the same animal and sort of see how you feel about how they're depicted. So these orangutan, orangutans, and I did not take these pictures, by the way. Um, I think it, for me at least, the one on the left is sort of more compelling. It's sort of more uh, aesthetically pleasing. Um, it shows sort of a more of a connection between the two animals. And so I see it as a more powerful image. Here we have some cheetahs. Um, again, I did not take these pictures. Uh, this is a wonderful, a wonderful photo. Um, so here's a, a mother with her young shaking off some, some rainwater. And um, so the one here that you might feel, and maybe you don't all agree, but you might feel more effective is the one on the right. Um, it's just sort of more compelling, tells more of a story. Um, or we have this, I think this is a serval cat, but I'm not sure. Ocelot, ocelot, very good. Um, is by Joel Sartore. So when you look at these two images, the one on the right, I think, really sort of pulls you in more um, and is, is more dramatic and compelling. Uh, here we have a bunch of, um, a group of, of guards, of rhinos with their dog and then we have another picture that shows them with the rhino. And 
I think that sort of tells more of a, a compelling story, um, that one on the right, because it really tells the story of, of what they're trying to protect. And so the stronger photos, what do they have in common? Um, certainly the things that make a photo effective are strong composition, uh, good light, and something interesting going on. And often for me, it's about capturing the relationships between animals. Um, they might be within a family, they might be across species. Um, but there's a famous photographer for National Geographic, and he's with the International League of Conservation Photographers, Joel Sartore. And conservation photographers really cite this quote of his as sort of the best descriptor of conservation photography. He says, the typical nature phot photograph shows a butterfly on a pretty flower. The conservation photograph shows the same thing, but with a bulldozer coming at it in the background. This doesn't mean that there's no room for beautiful pictures. In fact, we need beautiful images as much as the issues, but it does mean that the images exist for a reason to save the earth while we still can. So, you know, here in the Bahamas, there's so many, so many natural naturally beautiful aspects, but there's also this story of what's happening to threaten this sort of the integrity of those natural aspects and to take photos that sort of show those two elements that can result in really powerful photography. So conservation photography is about telling a story. Um, so for instance with rhinos a series of photographs might show them in their habitat to tell the story of how they need to be protect, protected 24 hours a day by people with guns. Um, sometimes rhino horns are removed to try to remove the incentive to kill them. Um, and here's a young orphaned rhino um, sort of mouthing its keeper's hand. So. And sometimes, you know, I really think that when people feel like I do after seeing images like this, that maybe they will do something. Maybe they w it will sort of spur them to really care and move them to action. And um, so here are a few, few pictures of forest elephants that sort of tell uh, the story of them and their habitat. Um, they live in very dense forest. Um, and actually this is... Sometimes you can even find them on the beach, like in Gabon. In Gabon, they can be photographed on the beach. I haven't been there yet. I hope to go someday. But forest elephants live in really dense cover. And very little is known about them because they're, they're hard to find, they're hard to see, and you can't do census counts from flying over them because um, you, you can't see them from a plane. So typically, they've been counted uh, in a very sort of rough way through counting dial, um, piles of dung along transects. And as you can imagine, there's issues with that. Um, so again, I just want to go over some of these points about what makes a photo effective um, and why, why do we want a photo to be effective? Because we want it to tell a story. This photo won a lot of awards a couple years ago. It shows brown pelicans covered with oil um, from the Gulf spill. And it just really tells a powerful story. Um, or this, there's a stork in piles of garbage. I can't remember where this is. I didn't take this. Um, or this, I think, is a laser, a laser on albatross at, at Midway Atoll that um, has a lot of plastics uh, were found in its stomach. So um, I think one of the main things I want to get across is that if you're trying to protect a species, you can't separate it from its habitat. You have to protect its habitat, too. So a lot of photos that you're going to take if you're interested in conservation photography are going to be about showing that setting, showing that habitat. Um, 
So, for example, I was down in Florida a couple years ago, and I was asked by an organization there to help them document a uh, rookery, an island rookery. And we went out on a boat, and I took pictures of the brown pelicans and their chicks. Um, but I, you know, I took these sort of intimate photos, but I also needed to really pull back and show the setting of that island. I needed to show the pelicans on the, on the beach and in the trees and um, show the island in its entirety. And they ended up using all my photos in, um, in some literature that they're using for training uh, volunteers. And, you know, a lot of what I do is, is volunteer myself. I'm, I give a lot of my photos to issues that I care about, and I'm sorry to say that you're really not going to make much money as a conservation photographer because a lot of the organizations you're trying to support don't have uh, funds for photographs. And so you just, and that's sort of how you get your foot in the door. Um, I've also been helping with an island in Canada that has a lot of owls that winter there. It's called Amherst Island in Ontario, and there's quite a few snowy owls that winter there, and um, actually many species. But it's threatened by um, many windmills that I think would be badly sighted there. I, you know, I think this is certainly... Um, Something we need to consider is is energy from wind farms, but here on this island of Amherst, it's it's a tiny island that's a real jewel, and um, I'm trying to help tell the story for them. So this is a picture I took that I contributed to them, and that's another island, Amherst. Uh, Amherst Island is that island that the the tree is on and the owl is is sitting on. The mills are on a neighboring island um, that unsuccessfully was campaigning against the mills. And then now they're there, and they're finding lots of dead, dead birds. So I've been contributing my images, images to that issue. Um, I've spent a lot of time traveling for photography and um, taking pictures of animals and habitats that I care about. And a lot about conservation photography is that you're trying to get, it's not just about taking the picture, it's about what do you do with your pictures after you've taken them? Whose hands can you get them into? You know, who cares about that issue? So wherever I go and wherever I take pictures, I'm always thinking, you know, I try to somehow make a living. It's hard as a wildlife photographer, it's very hard, but... Um, I'm always thinking about, okay, so, so what can I do with my photos? I don't just want to take pretty pictures. I want to do something with my pictures and make them count. So this is a sharp-tailed grouse that I photographed in Montana. Sometimes I just go out to an area that I'm interested in, and I'll just rent a car and, and drive around and just take pictures all day long. And I had a wonderful week and a half in Montana a couple years ago doing exactly that. And I photographed this sharp-tailed grouse from a blind. And you really can't separate that grouse from its habitat, from the, the plains and the prairie of, of the Midwest. And um, so I took a lot of pictures of the, of the habitat as well. You can't separate an American white pelican from, from the lakes uh, that they're drawn to breeding in. And, so I'm always trying to think wider now. You know, I used to really be into very intimate, tight shots of animals, and now I'm really trying to think about the habitat and bringing that into my work because I want to be able to tell stories and to really link an animal to its setting because I think that's, that's much more powerful. A couple years ago, I, I had a neat experience in Nebraska at this braided river that runs through it that is well known for its sandhill cranes that migrate through every year. In fact, it's our country's greatest migration is the sandhill crane migration along the Platte River in Nebraska. It's taking place right now. Uh, there's over half a million sandhill cranes that use this flyway. And they stop along the Platte River 
to fatten up for their trip north to their breeding grounds. And over a period of about six to eight weeks, you have hundreds of thousands of sandhill cranes, and it's just it's an unbelievable experience to have them wheeling over you and their cries filling the air. And you go down to the river, and they spend the night there uh, along the river because they feel safer from predators there. And then when morning comes, they, they lift off and they go out to the cornfields uh, to feed all day long. Um, I'm going to be back there in a week. I'm going to be co-leading a photo workshop there this year. I'm really excited to be back there. It's a place that Jane Goodall goes every year with a good friend of mine uh, because she feels it's, it's one of the greatest um, wonders of the world. I highly recommend people to go someday. So I went on assignment for Smithsonian Magazine uh, with a writer, Alex Shumatov, to bring attention to this migration in this extraordinary place. And, you know, I really tried to get a range of photos. I tried to show the habitat. I tried to show sort of closer, tighter images of interactions between uh, the cranes. You know, they do these sort of dances with one another and um, they're just beautiful creatures. But I felt like I wasn't really getting the sort of full sense of it and I was sort of panicking by the last day of my week there and I decided to rent a plane and get some aerial shots at sunrise. And I'd never shot from a plane before. It was a little bit challenging, so I'm hanging out this window and, you know, the wind's just like buffeting me. It was absolutely frigid. And, but I managed to get some decent shots. There was good light and the cranes were just all along this beautiful braided river, the Platte. So that story came out in the Smithsonian Magazine. Flight Club, it's called. It's still online. You can read it and see my pictures at smithsonianmag.com slash cranes, I believe. And uh, a month or two after this, or maybe it was a few months after this came out, there was a, a news story published that this, this story, which had been seen by a couple million people probably, was worth over $2 million to the Department of Tourism in Nebraska. Um, and they saw a, a definite uptick in their numbers of visitors the next year. And so I get really excited about things like that. I get really excited about going to places that I care about, bringing attention. I'm doing more writing now myself, but I also really like to partner with writers. Um, this guy Alex and I have done three stories together now. We were just in Uganda doing a story on the endangered Rothschild giraffe and that'll be coming out in the magazine this year. And then we've also done a story on the spirit bear, which is the, also known as the Kermode bear. It's, the, it's a white black bear in British Columbia in the Great Bear Rainforest. There's thought to be only about 200 to 300 of them. Uh, it's a recessive gene, they're not albino. Um, and we went out there a year before last and we had a couple hours with a, an adult female and her uh, cub, cub of the year, and um, it was an incredible experience. And that story just came out, I think, in the last September's issue, and it's online as well. You can see the pictures and read the story by Alex and my pictures. Um, and I think that's helped to bring a lot of attention to uh, that place and to the people of that place. And the guy that I work with, Alex Shumatov, he's a very well-known writer in the US, and he um, he's really loves going into a place and telling a very complex story about the people of the place as well as the animals. And I'm really hoping to work with him to tell the story of Inagua and possibly to tell the story of Andros. And so I will be turning my attentions to that when I get home to try to put pitches together because I really would love for more people to know about um, just the wonders, the wonders that you all have here. So I try to educate people locally as well about issues that I care about. I'm, 
a nut about birds. And this is a picture that I've actually sold quite a few prints of. It really hits people hard. It's sort of this tragic story. Um, a neighbor of mine had this pair of scarlet tanagers. The red, the red is the male. The female's the yellow. They're in breeding plumage. And this was springtime. I'm just guessing, but I think he was probably chasing her. And they flew into a glass window at my neighbor's and both died. I didn't find them like this. They were sort of willy-nilly on the ground, but I uh, posed them. And I share this picture in places like Facebook. Um, and then when I exhibit it, I tell the story because I try to educate people about window strikes. Windows, glass windows kill so many billions of birds a year, particularly during migration time. Um, and it's just, it's a tragic story and it's, it's easily prevented. And there's things that all of us can do. You know, if you find a bird has hit your window, that's a signal to you. This, this is a window that I need to put some kind of, whether it's a decal or a, a window, a strip of some kind, or there's all kinds of homemade stuff you can do as well as, as buying something specifically for that purpose. But I think it's something that we all have the power to do just in our own lives is make little changes like this, whether it's keeping your cat indoors or um, putting something like this on your windows. These are simple things that we can do. And so I, I really love to educate people about basic ways that we can have an impact on conservation. And I do that through my photography. Five minutes remaining. OK. Um, so I just want to quickly go over some, I'm almost done. And I, I do want to leave just like a couple minutes for questions in case anyone has them. Um, and if, if people want to like use their phone to take a quick picture of this, um, or they can write me and I can, I can send them um, these ideas. But uh, some things you can do. So get yourself a camera. Uh, you could get it like a medium budget SLR, digital SLR with a standard zoom lens. There's wonderful point and shoots now that are available that I see people taking spectacular pictures with. It doesn't have to be um, interchangeable lenses now. You can get a great point and shoot. Take a basic photography and post-processing workshop. Study the work of leading photographers. Go to that website I told you about, International League of Conservation Photographers. Look at their work. Um, join a nature club. Take up bird watching. Keep your eyes open. Be alert. There's a story even in the crows that you see daily or in the wetlands near you. Um, you can write up a photo story or make a video presentation to people in your area. Um, one idea is find an endangered bird or lo location. Research it. Is it protected? Does it need protecting? Does anyone know about it? Go to your site as often as you can for a month or even a year. Photograph everything that makes that place special. Team up with a researcher who might want to study that species. Take beauty shots or take shots of the threats to those creatures. At the end of your time in that location, choose your favorite shots and take a portfolio around to through two or three places that care about your location. Another idea is volunteer for a local citizen science or restoration project. You can both help with the project and also document the conservation effort as it happens. Publish the photos with the nonprofit spearheading the project and pitch it to some local papers or magazines. So those are just a couple ideas. Um, if anybody wants to run ideas by me at any time or ask for advice, uh, you can contact me um, through my website. And I'm happy to help, uh, give suggestions. And um, I just encourage people to do what they can to document the places and the creatures that they care about, because we really need everybody's help out there. <laughs>